Hello, welcome to Eternity Now. I'm Chuck Young. Today we've got a very special guest. In fact, uh, Steve Haley has been with us before as we discuss the Seventh-day Adventist Church and his role as the president of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference of Seventh-day Adventist. You know, the first time that I uh, saw Steve was in a photograph. Uh, he had on a police uniform and was standing next to the biggest Harley-Davidson motorcycle that I've ever seen. You know, I'm really interested to see what Steve has to share with us uh, about his life and about how he came to know Jesus Christ and just where he's at today with the Lord. Steve, thank you so much for being here. God bless you and share uh, your personal testimony with us. Well, thank you. It's, it's a privilege and a delight to be with you this evening. And uh, maybe it sounds a little strange that it's not my favorite topic to talk about myself, but when asked to speak about what Jesus means to me and where He's led me and what He's done for me, it is indeed a wonderful privilege. And uh, to that end, and for that purpose, I'm not shy to talk about what He's done for me. And everyone's story is unique and important. And uh, so, yes, I'd be happy to tell you a little bit more about where God found me and where He's brought me. My story actually begins <laughs> as uh, any personal autobiographical autobi account would with um, my being born in uh, the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. My family roots actually are quite firmly uh, grounded in uh, rural Tennessee where my great-great-grandparents and my great-grandparents and even my grandfather was born just above Knoxville. But by the time uh, the, of the early 1930s and 40s, uh, on this is the maternal side of my family. The uh, coal mines was a rough way to make a living and uh, for my family and uh, as I said my uh, great great grandparents uh, it seemed to be uh, a lot more attractive to go to an area where there was the promise of work. And so uh, the family migrates to uh, the area of Washington DC, the Maryland portion uh, of uh, that metro area and uh, there my grandfather uh, on my mother's side finds work on a dairy farm back when in this very heavily urbanized area there were such things as dairy farms and it would be there that um, I would be born uh, in a family where my father was not a Christian um, but my mother um, at the time of my birth was a uh, committed Seventh-day Adventist and uh, despite some of the challenges of uh, being part of uh, a family in a marriage where it was a mixed marriage, as I said, my dad was not a believer. Uh, my mother was committed to bringing uh, her children, her three sons, to church on a very regular basis. And even to this day, uh, I look back and think that was an extremely important part of, uh, of, of my foundation of my life that um, with certainty, at least in my own view, would play a very important role uh, in, in the Lord leading me and uh, in bringing me to eventually make a, an important adult decision, decision to be a disciple and a follower. So um, by, uh, by memory, um, some of my most precious childhood experiences included being in church and being in uh, what the Seventh-day Adventist Church calls Sabbath school, like Sunday school, except of course we meet in the biblical Sabbath or Saturday. And uh, that experience would continue until uh, my earliest teenage years when, um, regrettably, there came a period of time when, when maybe understandably, my mother was uh, a little discouraged. It was hard, I think, to uh, try to continue uh, uh, a, a, uh, to parent almost uh, as a single parent. My father not only was challenged uh, in terms of not being a believer, that, that of course, stress the family and my mother's desire to raise her children in a Christian environment. But my father, who's been dead now many years, struggled with alcoholism. And so it, that was a challenging environment. And again, by the time I was maybe 12 years old, uh, my mother had grown a bit discouraged and uh, we were no longer attending church regularly. Um, it's, it's not a statement of what a great person I was either then or am now, but I think some of those things I learned as a child uh, in Sabbath school and some of the, the things that maybe the Holy Spirit had laid on my heart were important, so, so much so that even as a teenager, while my brothers and my mother 
had stopped attending church, I would try to catch a ride with some Seventh-day Adventist neighbors who lived just a block away, and uh, commonly I would go to church with them. Maybe an important step that I would take that, uh, again, all of this is, is to the glory of God and, and my incredible gratitude to, to the grace He's demonstrated to me, is that when I turned uh, 14 or 15, uh, I was baptized and uh, elected to make a decision to uh, attend one of our Seventh-day Adventist high schools, a, a boarding school where boys and girls could go and live in a dormitory. And, and actually, we have a boarding school here in the Nashville area called Highland Academy, about 30 miles from where our studio is. Um, and so making that decision would become important because through grades 9 and 10, and uh, a little interruption to attend public school one year, but back for my senior year, uh, in those very important, critical, foundational years, uh, Jesus would become meaningful to me, an important a part of my life. Now, those who would remember me from high school would admit and would acknowledge, as I would, that uh, I wasn't exactly a spiritual giant on the campus of that uh, school and uh, still had uh, a, a high degree of immaturity and wasn't certain that I was ready to make a an adult, mature, lifetime commitment to Jesus. But it would be during that time that uh, I, I discovered that uh, I wanted God to be an important part of my life. But like many 17 or 18 year olds, I wasn't sure I wanted to give him uh, complete authority. I think even in my mind, I probably mused that there will come a day when I'm old and, and uh, the, the challenges and temptations of life are less than they were to a 17 or 18 year old, and maybe then God could become important. And maybe then uh, <laughs> Jesus could, uh, could be my Lord and Savior. But uh, there were some things that I wanted to do. I had uh, a brief stint in the military and uh, then would go on to college for a little bit. Um, but since the time I'd been a small boy and through my high school years, if asked, what would you like to do in life? I said, I want to be a policeman. <laughs> and uh, uh, at the time, and I, I think still true today, in order to be hired as a professional law enforcement officer, you have to be 21. And uh, so after high school, I uh, worked on a college degree in criminal justice. And when I turned 21, I applied to the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Force and uh, had gone through the first round of processing and taking some tests with them. Um, and to this day, I'm very grateful. Uh, during the time I was ta taking that, uh, the testing and being uh, evaluated and referenced for consideration to be hired as a police officer, officer there, the city of Rockville, Maryland, the county seat of Montgomery County, one of uh, two large counties that border Washington, D.C. on the northwest side of the city, uh, the city police force where I had applied called and said, would you like to work for us? Now, I'm relieved because um, I believe that maybe that environment and that setting was, was maybe a, a much better place for me to serve in law enforcement than metropolitan Washington, D.C. <laughs> Let me ask you something about uh, that. At that point when you were deciding you wanted to be a police officer, were you praying through those kinds of decisions? And uh, did you feel like the Lord was moving you in that direction? Or were you just kind of following after your childhood uh, dreams? Mm -hmm. Well, you've asked a, a very uh, honest question. I'll give you an honest answer. Again, I, I'd like to say that um, spiritually it was a mature decision that was bathed in prayer, but the answer would be no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it, your honesty on that. Well, it was, no, it was more just uh, a, an ambition that I had nourished as a, as a child through my teenage years. And I think even in my high school yearbook to this day, if you looked up uh, my picture in one of those little uh, bullet points underneath it was, what's, what's your uh, career goal? And I put law enforcement. Um, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't characterize those years uh, uh, as a time when I would, would be thought of or, or even lived as a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Um, my own personal experience in law enforcement was both very gratifying uh, as well as challenging, and at least for myself and maybe others who served in that field, uh, the culture of law enforcement can be challenging spiritually. It's, it's an environment that uh, doesn't necessarily lend itself to um, uh, affirming uh, the practice of committed uh, conservative biblical values. In fact, it's probably to the opposite. And while uh, I enjoyed my experience in that field and uh, 
I believe uh, to, to the credit of the Lord and, and the good people I worked with, I had some success in it. Uh, increasingly, um, about my second year into the service as a police officer and then my third year, um, I became spiritually awakened in a way that would become very important to making a decision. And uh, that, that spiritual awakening, I, I have really uh, no uh, testimony to give as to how it took place except uh, an increased sense of, of the emptiness that, was, uh, that characterized my own soul and my own life. And uh, the nature of law enforcement for any thinking person, I think, um, does create uh, thoughts and convictions about the importance of life. And, and uh, there would be many times when uh, I would at least pause and think, that could have been me, or that person, except for the, maybe the grace of God, that could have been me. And uh, I had a part-time job on the weekend where I would work in a hospital setting and security to make extra money. And, and uh, I still remember carrying uh, infants that were just uh, weeks old who maybe died of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. I can remember carrying a, a small baby in a blanket that where the, the little lifeless body still felt a bit warm and taking them down to, to the morgue. And, and those were moments even for a 24-year-old that um, who hadn't taken life entirely seriously that really had me pondering about the meaning of life and, and importantly what I wanted to do with this one life that God gives any of us. I have the greatest respect even to this day for those who serve in this very important profession we call law enforcement. And some have asked, uh, would you have considered making it a career? I said, yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought about that. Uh, but yet when God grabbed hold of me uh, in a very marked way, I realized that with one life to live and um, um, just uh, important decisions that needed to be made, I realized I couldn't stay in law enforcement. And maybe because uh, my testimony, importantly, there's, a, there's some significant things happening right then. I might just add uh, just a couple more details. During this time, uh, I wasn't attending church. And again, I don't think I would be a, a poster child for, for Christianity. I, I don't know that I was living the most profligate lifestyle, but neither was I, I practicing the faith that I, that I learned as a child. Um, but I used to come home, I was single at the time, to my little apartment, and rather than switch on the television, I found myself reading scripture. And um, it's safe to say, and for some who have an experience like mine, that some of the uh, less than uh, positive consequences of growing up uh, in the church in the era of the 60s and 70s, perhaps the fault of myself and those who perceived it, is that the church taught a very straight and narrow way that seemed hard and difficult and, and behavior oriented. Well, I don't know whether that was true or not, but the fact is, as I began to read scripture many nights, coming home from my shift on the police department and opening the Bible, um, I began to read startling, wonderful things from, a, from the book of Romans, which will, to this day, always stay with me, that God had sent his son to die for my sins. And it, it wasn't because of how good I was or even how bad I was, but it was because of Jesus that mm. I could someday inher inherit eternal life. Now, what year was that, if you don't mind me asking? Sure. That's probably around the spring of 19, 1980. That's a long time ago, but, mm -hmm. but the uh, memory and experience is still fresh and alive of, of, uh, of the Word speaking to me in a way that it, it, it never had before. That was the very year that I started studying with some Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, God's Spirit this, was moving all over the place. He, he was point, in, yeah. uh, in Maryland and, and I guess here in the national area. Yes. Um, th through that study, that self-study, no one was sending me books, materials. No one was knocking on my door. No one was inviting me to church. But, and that was okay. But God was doing a great work and uh, speaking to me through His Word. And I can still remember tears just... Uh, rolling down my cheeks as I, as I realized that Jesus had done what I, I, I realized I could probably never do, and he paid the price. And uh, to this day, uh, within this church community, in this church I love so much, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm, I'm a champion of the themes of righteousness by faith and grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. It changed my life, and to this day, uh, I give credit to for being the, one of the central great truths 
that has transformed me, blessed me, and really led me to where I'm at today. Well, so at that point, you were still a police officer. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So how long were you, did you remain in law enforcement uh, after you had this renewed experience uh, with Christ and uh, began to just really realize that Jesus had died for your sins mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a new profound way? Uh, how much longer were you in law enforcement and then where did it take you from there? Sure. Well, I think, Chuck, for anyone who has an experience like this, and certainly the, the details change for all of us, but when, when God speaks to your life in a way that uh, uh, is transformational, and uh, I, I think it always leads to decisions that one has to make personally. And those decisions may just mean a, a change of behavior or sometimes a change of a job. Sometimes it can mean even, even greater things than that. But for me, uh, as I alluded to earlier, it meant just thinking through whether I wanted to remain in, in a profession that, again, as I shared, I have great respect for, uh, as, as a police officer or whether God had another plan. And at least I became convinced, for me, that that plan might include serving God professionally and in full-time ministry. And at the time, I really thought of uh, being a, a teacher in one of our high schools to teach Bible and, and uh, to lead others to Jesus through their, those teen years. As again, I shared, that was important to me. I never really thought of being a pastor. It may have gone through my mind, but I considered it and said, you know, that's for someone who is much more talented and a deeper, uh, drawn from a deeper spiritual pool than this little shallow puddle that Steve Haley. <laughs> um, but it would be during my time at uh, Southern Adventist University um, that something took place that I think was important. And I'll share, it's a personal uh, insight into this story, but uh, my junior year at Southern Adventist University, I mentioned my father, who was not a Christian and uh, a struggle with alcoholism. Uh, one day while I was at school, he called me in my dorm room, and this was quite unusual because he never called. And uh, like many people, I think he uh, had a lot of good qualities, but uh, among other challenges, uh, the alcoholism uh, limited his ability to love and support and parent his sons. So this call was unusual, and as we talked a bit, um, the, just details that I still remember, but the phone call ended with him saying something was quite rare in my household. He said, hey, I love you. I love you guys. My brother was in school there with me, but it just happened to be me on the phone. I said, well, I uh, love you too, Dad. I mean, it was just something he never said and, and we never said back. Uh, but I, but I, I hung up from that phone call and it was about a week later that I came back to my room one night and there on the uh, door of my dormitory room was a note and it said, call home, your dad's died. Uh, it, was a, it was a shocking oh. way to learn that news and um, uh, I of course immediately called my mother and my brother and, and uh, he had died suddenly uh, of a heart attack at 48 years old. Mm. After a few days and in, in a given course of some time, I realized that I felt responsible, and, and, and maybe I didn't need to, but I did bear some responsibility that I didn't feel I'd done what I could to tell him about Jesus. Mm. And if I could wind back the clock and, and relive that moment, uh, I think even on the phone I, I would have talked to him very directly and pointedly about Jesus. Um, that became maybe an important part of thinking about ministry and whether more than being a Bible teacher, which is a great calling, Perhaps God had another plan. And uh, as time went on, I began to take some classes that would uh, prepare me for pastoral ministry. And uh, during a time when I was student teaching on the campus of Georgia Crumlin Academy, um, I had a conversation with a person who's doing what I'm doing in Georgia. It's called the Georgia Crumlin Conference. They were president of that conference? Exactly. Okay. And in that conversation, he said, I understand you have some thoughts about uh, being in ministry someday, and is that true? Well, yes, it is. Would you consider going to the seminary where you would receive your graduate degree and maybe preparing further for that? I said, well, yeah, I think maybe God's leading that way. Well, it was a great conversation. It sounded promising, but a number of weeks went by and I heard nothing. And the school year was ending. I was preparing to graduate. I didn't have a job and uh, wasn't sure what, what I was going to do or what God wanted me to do. But one day on the campus of Georgia Crumlin Academy, there near the river that borders the uh, back part of the property, 
and wrestling with the future and whether I should be a teacher or whether this, this new sense of being a, a minister is weighing on my heart, I knelt down by the side of that river and said, Lord, I think you're calling me to be a pastor. And if that means going back to school, even after I graduate, I'm willing to do that. And uh, all my fears aside, and all of, my, uh, uh, all of the recognition of my weaknesses pushed back, I'm ready to do that, I'm yours. And it was within 24 hours that I received a phone call from uh, Gary Patterson, the president of the George Cummings Conference, who said, we'd like you to go to the seminary. What do you think of that? I didn't tell him the story that I've shared with you, but I thought God's timing has convinced me that the answer is <laughs> absolutely yes. That would lead to uh, uh, many wonderful years of uh, pastoring in the state of Georgia and East Tennessee uh, and doing some things administratively for the church organization, including uh, hiring and recruiting pastors and uh, a role called uh, Vice President for Administration uh, in Georgia Cumberland. And then uh, just about four years ago, right now, uh, I received a phone call one day asking if I would uh, be the president of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. The person on the other end of the line said they voted, they've elected you. It was quite a shocking phone call. <laughs> and actually my response was after a couple of days, I said, let me think about it, let me consider it, let me pray, let me... Uh, now we, they voted you in and then called you and told that's you the way they voted did it. in? They voted me, you're it, and what do you think about that? I got to th gotta think a lot about that. And uh, a week or so later, I actually called back and had given a lot of thought and said, you know, uh, we're going to decline. <laughs> My wife and I think uh, maybe it's just not right for us right now. Wow. But of course, I'm doing it today, and maybe uh, the last part of my testimony can be, so how did that happen? Um, I, I don't know how to explain it, and it's somewhat of a unique experience in my life, but there was this very quickly after the no, I don't think this is the right role for me. Um, again, I'm not sure how to couch it except to say that it seemed to me that I had given the wrong answer and that God had another plan. I even told myself, I think maybe they'll ask me again. I have no reason to believe I'll be asked to do it again, but if asked again, I know that I'm supposed to say yes. And uh, again, there is no, no uh, uh, reason to believe I would be asked to do this, this ministry a second time. Uh, but in the passage of weeks and even months, uh, I became aware that, that possibly they still didn't have a president. And uh, our technician in the back room, Elder Marvin Lohman, can remember that in the fall of uh, that year, 2009, he and I talked on the phone and explored a thing or two, and I said, hey, how's your presidential search going? And he said, well, we're still looking. you have any interest? And I said, well, you know, maybe. <laughs> And from that conversation, uh, the There committee, was the question again that you were waiting to hear. That's right. And perhaps his answer would have been, well, no, we found the person and uh, you had your chance. <laughs> but again, there was, this, there was this in the background of my mind that I think they may ask me again. And, and even when I realized that the committee that selects this person had moved on and asked another candidate, I know this sounds arrogant. I don't mean to sound that way, but I thought, thought God's hand is in this in a marked way. And, no, they didn't ask me. Oh, I guess I misunderstood. I guess I misunderstood the way God was leading. But eventually, to shorten the story, yes, they, they did ask a second time. And uh, I knew what my answer had to be. And uh, fairly quickly was, yes, I'll come and do this. So uh, four year, almost four years later, it'll be four years at the end of the year, it's been a great experience to be the president of uh, the Kentucky-Tennessee Conference. It's a great place. Uh, with uh, about 40 pastors. We have uh, 11 elementaries, two high schools. We have, we have a camp called Indian Creek, about an hour east of Nashville, a youth camp uh, that serves the needs of youth throughout Metro Nashville. And the 14,000 members of this conference are some of, the, uh, are some of the, uh, God's good people that uh, it's just a privilege for me to serve and rub shoulders with. And uh, the, the, the ending part of my story is this is a great time to be a Seventh-day Adventist and to be a leader in the church. There's opportunity, there's unquestionably challenges, but God's doing some great things, and I believe it's in preparation for His soon coming. Amen. What a wonderful testimony, taking <laughs> us from your birth to your experience with Christ and being raised in the church and then 
uh, stepping away uh, for a little while uh, as you became a police officer and then called back to the Lord and ultimately the ministry and then finally landing as the president of the uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, Kentucky Tennessee Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Just what a what a wonderful chain of events there. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of minutes left. Can you just briefly tell us what does the president of a conference do? The, the president has uh, the opportunity and even the obligation to be involved in a lot of things. In a sense, I liken the work of the conference to in some ways like a big company. Uh, we, we will receive uh, five, six million dollars in offerings and tithes this year. And uh, the complexity of the organization, the size of it, uh, the scope of it demands uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of investment on the part of myself and a great team of people that I'm, that I'm surrounded with. Those decisions include uh, matters that are legal and financial and importantly the ones that maybe uh, many people think of first and foremost is how to advance the mission of this church to uh, seek and to save the lost, to expand the uh, the roles of the citizenship of the kingdom of God, and that's, uh, that's an area that occupies our thinking at least a part of almost every day. How do we do this better? Knowing that we're living in the light of Jesus' soon return, um, how can we take uh, the trust of the people that's, that uh, we're a part of and who, who, who want us to help lead? Uh, what can we do to, uh, to honor the Lord and, um, and, and affirm that trust put in us to uh, advance this great, great mission of, of the church. So uh, I would say while it sounds like a big task, uh, God is able and sufficient. I have some great people that serve this church as teachers and uh, people, door-to-door uh, -door Christian book salesmen. We call them literature evangelists. Uh, our pastors, uh, our support staff, and uh, I, admittedly, it's just a great role. I'm honored and humbled to be asked to, uh, to serve in it. And um, I suppose my hope is to do it as long as God wants me to. <laughs> and it's been a real blessing to hear your testimony, how the Lord has guided your life. Thank you so much for being here with our interview with Steve Haley today. And uh, I hope you come back to Eternity Now. Thank you so much. Thank you.